All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here at six o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, appreciate you being in attendance tonight, our October uh, Board of Trustees workshop. Uh, this will serve as our tier two board training for the year. Um, and our topic tonight will be district safety and security matters. And we'll get to that here in just one second. Um, first thing I want to do is congratulate um, Scott Moore here. He is, uh, been selected to be one of the four representatives to work with the TASB Board of Directors to set TASB positions for the next legislative session. So he is a TASB statewide legislative committee member. Is that the correct title? Yeah, that'll work. So congratulations to Mr. Moore. I know that you will do a fine job. We appreciate you giving up that extra time. Um, tonight we are going to discuss safety and security matters. That's going to be our primary topic. And uh, because we are holding this session in open session of the board, um, we'll, we're going to keep it pretty high level with with the conversation. And um, as we present, you know, if you have specific questions, there may be some questions that are declined to be answered tonight in open session. And if you, you know, would prefer uh, or seek out more information, you can come individually to myself, Dr. Hines. We can try to answer those or if, if there's information that you would like to have presented in a future closed session of the board, we can do that. But we want to try to respect and not share more information than we should here in, in the open session to protect our schools. <clears throat> um, we are very fortunate tonight to be uh, joined by Dr. Brian Zimica. He is the deputy director of the Region 6 ESC, and we are working with uh, Region 6 tonight to provide both Tier 2 training and this safety training. So, Mr. Zimica, Dr. Zimica, thank you. We appreciate you being here. And uh, Dr. Hines will also be presenting. Gentlemen, if you want to go ahead and come up, we'll get ready to jump right in. In typical to our normal, um, what has become our, our now normal workshop session, you know, we're, we have a presentation, but it's a conversation. Any, anything that you would like to have, please uh, have them jump in. What you'll see tonight is um, kind of a tag team approach between Dr. Zimlicka and Dr. Hines, as you will see the state's view and then specifically how it relates to Conroe ISD. Um, you have a, a copy of all of the slides in front of you. You can see there are quite a few and they will um, continue to move through them fairly quickly. So if you have questions, please stop them along the way and, and we'll make sure to answer those for you. Um, so is there any questions before we get started? All right, we'll turn it over to Dr. Hines. All right, well, um, again, good evening. And uh, this evening we're gonna try to work through, uh, it's kind of a dual presentation. Um, and, and Dr. Zimlicka will, will highlight uh, some of the new legislative sessions and some other things that, that, that came into play and then we have some slides where we try to provide some information about what we're doing in our district uh, that, that hopefully will answer some of those questions and we'll just try to keep it moving for you. Uh, we also have a few folks in the audience I do want to introduce <coughs> because uh, they're, they've really helped us put our responses together. Barbara Robertson is here, who's our lead nurse and uh, does a lot of great work. We have great staff. Denise Apollo is here tonight, who's our uh, coordinator of guidance and counseling. And, um, a lot going on in that area. Um, Mr. Easy Foster from Planning and Construction, of course you know. Um, Mr., uh, Mr. Ethan Barton is with us. Uh, he is our coordinator of school safety. Uh, Mr. Caker to my left is assistant superintendent of operations who reports, uh, Ethan reports to him. Uh, and of course you know Chief Harness. But, um, so we have, I'm sure there's other folks that came related to our safety. Um, they, they've all helped to put our responses for you together. Well, listen, I, my name is Brian Zimuk, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. And again, I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Noel and, and, and Dr. Hines here for, for their assistance. And this is unique. We Typically, when I do board training, it's just me, and I have never really had any support. And so it's been, it's been fun these last couple of weeks to work together uh, with Dr. Noel on this. I've traveled all over the region, Region 6, which we're located in Huntsville. We have 57 districts in our region. I've traveled all over the region uh, providing a legislative update to all of our school boards from this last legislative session, which, is, by the way, was the biggest uh, session that they've probably ever had. And you're going to find out here in probably late October when you get your TASB update 114, it'll be over 1,000 pages long. And so there was a lot of changes, and there was a lot of things doing with safety. 
on that first slide where it said safety is an attitude and that attitude is everything. It's sort of a credo that I've lived, lived by since I uh, was an administrator some 20 years ago. Uh, safety is like a roof on your house. It's really not important until it starts to leak. It's kind of like the tires on your car. You're driving down the road and all of a sudden you got a flat. And you get out there and look, they're four ball tires. That's kind of how safety is. You don't really think about it until something terrible happens and then all of a sudden we all start jumping trying to fix it. That previous slide right here, uh, safety, uh, we are in this together. That's what's prompted the big push that we have now in Texas was the Santa Fe shooting. And unfortunately, and I, I, this is really a true story. My wife's a police officer of 20 years with Willis ISD. She works at SRO with Willis ISD. We laid down one night, laid in bed. And I don't know why, I don't know where, why the conversation came up, but I said, and I guess I think we had, there had been some school shootings somewhere else in other states. I said, you know, we've never had a major school shooting in the state of Texas. I mean, I just, I was bragging to say that that's because Texans take care of, they take care of business and and that's why it is. And then the very next day, Santa Fe happened. I mean, that's just how it changed. And so I think now our legislators have 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 woken up a little bit and, and made some changes. I'm going to say this. In Region 6, we represent 10 counties. But bar none, by far, the most progressive county is Montgomery County, just because of where you're located. And the most progressive district is Conroe ISD. I mean, it's just because of your size, you're our largest district and you have so much support. And so you do so many things that <coughs> some districts hadn't even thought about doing yet. And I'm, so I'm giving you kudos. <clears throat> and I think tonight's purpose is to maybe let you know some of the great things that you're doing. And so, yeah, I'm going to kind of talk about what's required. And then and then Dr. Hines is going to talk about what it is that that y'all already do. So we're going to talk about planning, recommendations for districts. We're going to talk about some legislation. And following each one of those, we're going to talk about what some of your current practices are. So let me ask you as a board, this is, so what role does the board play in school safety? Anybody, please let, tell me, what, is it, what role do y'all play as a member here? I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm not going to call you seven board members. I'm going to call you a team of eight, including your superintendent. Approval of policy and expenditure. Okay. I think it's a support, similar to what Mr. Hudson said, support the recommendations that um, the subject matter experts bring to our attention and make sure that it's just within reason from a financial perspective, just as Mr. Hudson mentioned. Absolutely. You know what? You're going you're gonna to approve that policy, and you're going to make sure before you approve that policy that you can afford it, afford that policy. Right. So, so how does the culture and the climate of the board slash di district slash campus impact school safety? I think we set the tone. You do. Obviously, you set the tone. It's, and we hold our uh, our administration accountable for making sure that the culture is one of safety and security. Around Absolutely. Us. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're a, you're a team of eight. And again, what's important here in this boardroom is going to be important outside at the lower levels, regardless of what it is. If Tidley Wings were important here, it would be important at the elementary school. I'm just, I mean, it's just that's how vital what you do and how vital it is that you work together. So again, yeah, you, you set the tone. So it says, how can the board help the community, the community better understand school safety? Because I think maybe that's a part of why we're here tonight, uh, to let you know what you have so that when people ask you or approach you, you have the answer. So again, how, how, tell me, how can we help the community better understand? I think with communication, like you're saying, that... Uh be able to, uh, uh, when people raise some issues or concerns, uh, listen to them and also tell them what we do have going on. Yeah, it's true. Anybody else? I think the other thing, I believe <laughs> it's already been done, and that is coordination with other uh, law enforcement efforts within our county and, and making sure that all of us are talking together, that we're able to communicate back and forth, as Mr. Kidd was saying. It's not just communicating with the parents, but communicating with those resources so that we can make sure in a moment's notice that we can access those resources. It's exactly right. And what you're going to find out tonight that you're, you're, you're going to find out tonight that your district does a lot of those, most of them. Mm -hmm. Now, will it ever be perfect? I don't know that that's possible. But you know what? It's, it's a living document where we're constantly working. As long as we have mm -hmm. policies and procedures in place and we have the people back here that can put it together. I mean, you know. 
I mean, all we can do is just keep at it and keep communicating and keep working together. I think it's also important that that, that communication, particularly to the community also, I mean, like Dr. Like Mill said, we can't divulge everything that we have in place security wise, because then it gives people an opportunity to plan to defeat it. But to openly let them know that it is a multi-tiered approach. Absolutely. And, and Dr. Hines, rec you know, recognize some of these people in the room from, um, you know, from our nurses who are noticing things to our teachers who are trained in, in crisis intervention to our counselors and our, our campus administrators and it's <clears throat> our partnerships with Tri-County and looking at mental health and things like that and communicating that those things are important to the board. Those, those partnerships are important to the board because <clears throat> healthy schools make healthy communities. Absolutely. I would, I mean, it's about, I was, I was in a, you had a lot of your people today in Huntsville at Region 6 uh, with threat assessment. And it was, it's, a, it's just about, it's just, it's about communicating and, and helping to train people that when they see something that's not right, that they tell someone. And then, and it's again about working together, working together. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, it's not all about school shootings. There's a lot of other things that involve safety. I mean, you have trip hazards and you have, you just have things with, uh, with, with transportation. There's just, you know, so many things, but what's in the forefront is, is school shootings. And, you know, when you see something that's not right and you report it, uh, you, it, you, you never really know if you ever prevent it. You just know when it happens, you know, when the bad thing, but it's, but it's hard to, to, to know that you've prevented it. But as long as we work it together, the only way we can show that we're successful is it hasn't happened. So this first part is planning. And so just real quickly, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about safety and security audits. Uh, they've been safety and security audits now, I think have been around for the last 16 years or so. And what it does is it requires school districts to do an audit. It's in a three year cycle. So you're required to do a, an audit once every three years. Preferably though, this audit is ongoing and it's not something that you do in the last month or the last year. You just, you just constantly are doing it. And basically this audit covers everything. In Conroe ISD, it would be all of your buildings, your stadium, every building that you have, every closet that you have, every door that you have. It's just, it just encompasses the whole thing. And uh, it, it, it covers a lot about your emergency operation plan, and it just it's just an ongoing process. Right now, today, we're in the third year of the three-year cycle. So this cycle will be over on the last day of August. Your superintendent's going to receive a link sometime, at the, uh, sometime in stuff spring from the school safety center, and when he clicks on that link, it's going to ask him 50 questions regarding the safety audit. And he'll answer those questions and he will have met the requirement for your school safety audit. I will talk a little bit later. Uh, the legislators have made some changes uh, as far as, re as reporting it. But again, it's, it's, a, huge, it's a huge instrument uh, that, that takes time. You have the ability to do it yourself. Uh, we do it at Region 6, and I, I typically do safety audit for districts that are anywhere from 200 to 800 students, and so they just don't have the personnel. And, and help them to meet that requirement. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, those audits. We've been doing those, and we actually when we started doing audits uh, at the beginning, we actually did contract out in the last few years. We have been completing those in-house. Uh, those are done on a three-year cycle. We, we uh, stagger those. We don't do them all in one year. Uh, we have just begun two years ago doing additional audits where we send administrators visiting other schools to do audits. So we're doing kind of multi-layered audits. In addition to that, our police are always doing audits. Every time they step foot on a campus, they're doing an audit. Uh, and it's likewise with other similar positions, administrators and nurses and so on. Um, we do provide findings. We do do work orders based on those or we make improvements. Um, and we do comply with those requirements. And this is the end of that third year of this current cycle for us. So a big part of the school audit and a big part of school safety in general is the multi-hazard <clears throat> emergency operation plan. Your operation plan is the Bible of your school safety. I mean, it's everything. And it's just that way when you're not here any longer or your administration's changing over or whatever it is, there's always this document that people can just keep going and carry on. And again, it's just... It's a it's it, 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 it's a document that has uh, 
Google Maps of all of your campuses and just all the procedures and what happens if you have a shooting or what happens if you have a gas leak or what happens if you have flooding. I mean, it's, it's supposed to cover every aspect of safety. And again, uh, for a lot of districts, it's just something that's on paper and maybe not, maybe not practiced. Uh, but as we will see in this, this past session, uh, the legislators have really made some, uh, some heavy requirements of what the, what it is they want in their operation plan. Uh, one of the things that uh, we go by as far as your emergency operation plan, it ha it covers the, the, the four planning com components. One is basically mitigation and prevention. And it's just whether it's, it's just all trying to assess what a potential hazard is, whether it's natural or man-made, weather related, whatever, uh, you know, I, I, the one that comes to mind that would be unique to y'all would be dam failure. The dam of Conroe, like Conroe's dam fails. You know, what, what are we going to, what's going to happen? How are we going to proceed with that? You know, you have an airport, you have a, 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 an airplane that, that crashes somewhere in, in a neighborhood and it affects maybe a campus or it affects some of your students. It's just how, how are you going to help that? So it's, again, it's about talking about those, per, per, uh, those potential, uh, hazards then the next thing is pre preparedness and that is just about conducting drills it's about working with your first responders it's about training people to how are we going to react when it, when something happens then the, the the next the third part is response and all again it's just about it's just about good planning and it's just about communicating and and it's it's about trying to minimize the time uh, of being able to get to the emergency and then the last one is that boom, we've had an emergency. Now, how do we, how do we coordinate all the resources to get through it? Whether it's hurricane related or, if if possible, I mean, let's say it's an emergency where where there is some sort of a, a, a shooter on campus and some people are injured, you know, and we've have all of our all of our campuses locked down. How are we going to get those kids back to their parents? Okay, so there's all those things that we kind of have to talk through, and so those are the four, basically the four pillars that we follow. Let's go ahead. I missed some here. It's, it went real fast. Yeah, there we go. Okay, right here. So, um, right there. So, just to catch up a little bit on what we're doing in Conroe ISD, uh, we did give you a copy of our uh, EOP binders. Those are, they don't include all the EOPs. They're just kind of like the, what I call the cliff notes of the major ones that we issue to every uh, staff member. So, those go out to every, and there will be additional ones. I use an example of, uh, we, we develop protocols for handling medical waste, for example. Um, that doesn't go in that binder. It goes to the people that deal with that subject. Um, we have taken or are in the process of uh, having all of our administrators trained in incident command structures. So they've all taken those courses. Um, also, we do have campus administrative safety contacts that receive uh, training in the EOPs so that they understand what they have and how to do them and how to complete them. Um, and we have a software package for that. Dr. Hans, can I ask yes. on the EOP, where are these located in each uh, uh, cool. campus? They vary from campus to campus. So okay. some teachers keep them on a shelf. You know, we've been so in some where they, has, each teacher has, has one. one. Some put them in a, a go tub, okay. you know. One thing we always try to stress about EOP is the time to look at it and familiarize yourself is not when there's a crisis or an emergency right. happening. And so really it's about uh, training and drills and understanding that there are procedures we go through and just to familiarize yourself with them. Um, in addition, and I'll mention it later on, we our, our staff annually uh, complete several hours of safe schools courses or basically online safety courses. And so we'll, we'll mix in a variety of things this year. For example, we had active shooter uh, we might mix in, uh, and we did on some health-related things such as asthma or allergy reactions, um, trips, slips, and falls, avoidance, those kind of things. So uh, we try to gear it based on our data every year, and we rotate. We do blood-borne pathogens, it seems like, every year, or, or pest management. Um, so we do try to rotate those as well. There is uh, also we have a dedicated safety page in our Canvas, which is our learning management software, uh, with, which has resources. Um, and then you can see uh, this is just a, a screenshot of what those those look like. If I can jump in there, Dr. Yes, Hans, and you may mention this later if you are going to, I apologize. So <coughs> each EOP is different based on the campuses, based on 
what they may deal with. For example, if you're at Oak Ridge High School and you have a <coughs> railroad track running through your backyard, their, their EOP will look different than it may look for a different campus because they're going to address that or pipelines running yeah, we have we have three campuses that are required to have pipeline plans because of their uh, proximity <laughs> board being one of those that, that has to have a pipeline plan because there's one within a certain number of yards and part of our process of, of us auditing the campuses is as we've done our academic conferences this year dr hines uh, has done a great job of having the campus bring their eop so we've, we've not just talked about academics during this, these academic conferences they've they've brought in their emergency plan. Dr. Hines has asked questions and made sure that their plan was solid and we've been able to review that during this process as well. Okay, so the next part that I wanna cover is the governor's 40 point plan highlights. And this is just a highlight, it's not all 40, it's just a highlight that really really speak probably volumes more to your district than, in, than the other ones. Uh, the 40 point plan came as a result of the Santa Fe shooting. And then if you remember uh, the shooting that they had in uh, the, the church down there near San Antonio, Big Spring or- Sutherland Springs. What was it? Sutherland Springs. Sutherland Springs. So, you know, those things were really close together and, and uh, the governor pulled a, uh, basically a, a, a group of people that sort of represented all facets of, of emergency response and mental health and safety and, and sat down with them. and. He, they, they hammered out, I think over two days, they hammered out these 40 points that really, uh, I mean, I guess I'm just saying in my experience after reading them, they, they really were really 40 good points. And so just right here, the first one was to increase law enforcement on campuses. I mean, that's, I mean, we still have, we still have districts in our region. We found that out today. Yeah. They don't have law enforcement <clears throat> at all. They don't have an SRO. They don't have a, they have sheriff's department in their county. And they really don't have a relationship with them even then. And I'm hoping today they found out that they better develop that relationship. But anyway, again, they, to increase uh, in law enforcement, uh, provide active uh, shooter and emergency response training. You're, you're going to see uh, legislators address that and make some requirements. TEA review of safety and security audits, the same thing. There's going to be some, there's some legislation that's going to change some of the th way, that they kind of change the way we do some things. The hardening of facilities to integrate security with educational mission. Uh, now there's some requirements that when you build new campuses or you renovate old campuses, now there's going to be some guidelines that require safety guidelines that are required to build. I, I, have, I don't know what those guidelines are. Uh, I don't know what they are yet, but I would assume, you know, that they're going to be vestibules uh, with locked doors and safety glass and just those are just some of the things that he that he made a requirement uh, the next one was to prevention of and mental health training and support this is huge this is probably the biggest one that i thought personally made a bit is going to make a huge difference in our state mm -hmm. we're state of texas we love guns and our, our guns aren't going to go away and at the end of the day that's what i guess i'm proud of is the people in austin realize that they're not going to take our guns away and they, maybe they realize that's not the culprit our guns it's the people that have the guns and the mental illness that they have because you have to be mentally ill to do the, some of the things that have occurred. <laughs> so what, what's, what, what's happening is, is that we're going through, we're going to be required to have an incredible amount of training uh, with teachers, uh, administrators, counselors, law enforcement uh, to try to identify those people that, you know, potentially could have an issue. And again, you're going to see here a little bit later, we, we talk a little bit more about it, but it's a, it, it's, it's a lot of mental health. Then allow teachers the, the immediately removal students who assault <clears throat> teachers or threaten bodily injury to, uh, to self or others. Uh, and then if you want to see the, the whole 40 point plan, you just go to uh, tech, you know, gov texas.gov uploads and you'll be able to see the whole 40 point plan. Uh, but there are some things that y'all as a district already do talk a little bit about uh, some of those things that we've changed already in our designs. Uh, currently, uh, our police department provides craze training to staff and any employee registers for the course. They've been doing this for a few years, which is really uh, the response to an active shooter um, training. Also, you we have a picture up there. You, you're well aware we've been uh, moving towards a layered approach of our uh, campus entryways uh, for the last several years. We still have a few to go, um, but We've 
made uh, tremendous progress in that design. And there's a picture of a, a new lock system that we've uh, added this year with the opening of uh, Suchma Elementary. So now we have, um, and obviously our plan is to go forward and go back and retrofit older buildings with the new uh, door handles where you can be inside the building or inside the classroom and know if it's locked or unlocked. And yeah, that's always been one of those kind of uh, sticking points of to, to lock it, to open the door and put a key in it. And you really weren't sure if it was locked or not. So uh, that is something that we've changed in the new design. Um, the phrase acronym. Civilian so response to active shooter. <laughs> it is. Also, we have uh, ERIP system, which is where our safe plans go. So it's an online web-based place where our campuses develop their emergency operation plans. Um, we also have an active shooter e-learning course available to all campuses in the ERIP. And there's a, uh, there's a lot of resources in that online, including uh, setting up reunification and, and those types of uh, guidance and examples. Uh, all of our uh, staff completed the Safe Schools active shooter course this summer. All of uh, Montgomery County emergency response entities have access to our campus information. Um, uh, the 911 system has a, uh, a program called RAVE, and in there, there's a facility. Uh, Ethan Barton has gone in and, and put in uh, basically all of our uh, maps to our campuses and floor plans so that emergency responders can pull that up in the field. They can actually have <coughs> access to uh, our current information as well as they can uh, geofence it for 911 purposes. Uh, we also have critical personnel contact sheets for each campus that are uploaded into that document. So it's kind of like a resource where we put our information in so that if a, an outside agency besides our police department was making a response, they could pull up a map of the school or who they want to call and that kind of information. Also Montgomery County, the Emergency Operations Center has access to our campus and facility EOP as well. The ALERT, which is the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training, uh, is something that our police department has been doing for several years. Uh, and not only do they all the officers get trained, but they also are trainers of many of the surrounding uh, law enforcement agencies. So they, they come to us for the training. Um, our police department has multiple certified instructors who teach active shooter response to all CISD police officers as well as other law enforcement agencies in the area. Um, the training prepares our officers to respond swiftly, effectively, and to uh, confront and stop active shooters and also to work together as a team even if they're coming from different agencies so that they coordinate their efforts. Uh, in addition, medical training, all of our police officers receive training uh, in CPR, first aid, tactical emergency care, um, and alert first responder medical. And we'll talk a little bit more about another house bill later on and get into some more information about some of that training. Uh, mental health training, all of our police officers retrieve crisis intervention team, mental health, um, which they call SIT, Crisis Intervention Team, Police Mental Health Collaborative Program. And they go through that training. All of our, uh, our officers go through the Mental Health Peace Officer, which is a 40 hour certification course. Um, in addition, they all take the uh, Youth Mental Health First Aid course. And that is something that all of our nurses are in the process and all of our administrators and counselors are in the process of uh, being certified in. So all of our officers are now fully trained mental health peace officers? Yes, sir. We started that about 20 years ago. Thank you, Chief. Well, what, does that, what does that look like? It's a 40 hour class that talks about abnormal behavior, how to react to it. Uh, we have our own instructors now. We have an outside psychologist that, that works with us to help provide training. Uh, last training was in June. CITN. Well, every year we'll try to, uh, we'll host a class for outside and our new officers because uh, it is a 40 hour class. It is harder to put on different times. But. One of the uh, areas mentioned in the governor's plan was uh, coordinating with other agencies. Montgomery County Special Threat Response Group and Chief Harness and Captain Blakelock are both on the executive committee our members in this group. And that is a group um, that is developed to provide instructions and guidance to effectively shape the response of all agencies in Montgomery County. 
to an active <clears throat> shooter or violent intruder or hostile threat incident. The plan provides guidance for developing and implementing procedures in regards to response, training, ongoing uh, plan maintenance, and it includes participation by all of the uh, countywide uh, law enforcement, fire, and EMS agencies. The, uh, in addition, our uh, transportation department has partnered with Homeland Security and has provided transportation training specific. So now the next part of the presentation, presentation we're just going to talk a little bit about the recommended actions that, that uh, school districts should use, and, and, and they're in the form of, of really best practices. So the first one is school districts should reevaluate uh, access control and visitor management policies and procedures for all facilities. At the end of the day, it's about locking your doors. It's that simple. Just keep your doors locked. Some districts, you know, you have all your exterior doors locked, and then some districts then go above and beyond that and they have all their interior doors locked. When teachers have te kids in a the classroom, they have all of their doors locked. So just some of the best practices is just limiting the number of entrances, uh, utilizing uh, secure vestibules, monitoring all exits and entrances with security personnel, and utilizing technology in, in the, 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 with locking systems and monitoring systems with cameras and all that. I mean, we've, we've made it really, we've made it really handy and easy to be able to lock and unlock a door and then exterior doors locked from the outside. I mean, you, you, you would think that every district would have the exterior doors locked, but go to any high school and you've got kids coming everywhere to go into athletics, you go into ag, you go into all these different places. And sometimes that's just virtually impossible. But if you have the people there working in the building monitoring those doors, at least then you can minimize the times that they're going to be unlocked, which would be during class change. Again, it's, it's, it's an attitude. Just like I said before, it's an attitude, and attitude is everything. It, that's, that's all it is. And once you, once you start to do it, then, then you know what? You, you, you train yourself, and you do it anywhere you go. Uh, I mean, for me, I have a, I have a deal with, we have rugs that walk into a door and there's one of them that'll always be folded up. It just makes for a trip hazard. It doesn't matter if I'm walking into the service center or I'm walking into your administration building or I'm walking into lobbies. If there's one that's got a kink in it, I pull it, I pull it out. I, it's just something I've always done. And cause I've just bought into this, I've bought into safety. So again, it's just, it, it's anybody can do it. Uh, limiting the number of visitors or being able to at least monitor it and control them. And then obviously uh, testing uh, your school facilities, basically a personnel test to access the control of the, and the, with your visitors and just being able to manage it all. Uh, the next slide uh, or basically the next recommended action is that schools should empower all stakeholders to be situa situationally aware and to report suspicious activity. We learned that today. A school shooter, you can't you can't look at one and identify them because they're not, they have no pattern other than maybe a white male, 16 years old, but that's about as close as you can get. But one thing they all have in common is what they've used the term today, they have leakage, and that they they say something about it. They tell someone or they hint to someone or they write it somewhere. They all do that. And it's just about being able to have our entire district aware that when they see something, that they say something and that they do something. And it's just about training, being able to train it. Training, and then and what I learned today is uh, about having, ha having your district have an anonymous reporting system. I, I guess until today, I had never been aware of that. But, but if you have, an anonymous system and you have your kids trained that if they see something and it may not be legitimate, but as long as you know, and you can go and look into it, uh, you can, you can, you could, uh, potentially save many lives. And it's both phone and text. Yes, yes sir. Right. And this is our, uh, little bit of our information on it. We have both the kid chat line, the phone line, and then we have anonymous alerts, which is a way to do it electronically. Um, and it, there's a lot of advantages. Uh, if, the, if the student registers or the doesn't have to be a student, anyone, there's an the ability to uh, ask questions and they can answer back without knowing who they are. So that's a good feature, which has always been one of the limitations, but uh, it's one of those things we do with that. I think that one of the next uh, 
pieces that we want to that that uh, we want to talk about uh, that districts should utilize is that school schools must coordinate and collaborate with law enforcement and other first responders to develop strong school safety programs. We're, we're all fortunate that you live in Montgomery County. All of your first responders in your districts, they all communicate with each other. If something were to ever happen here in your district, you will be swarmed with first responders. You can guarantee that just because of the communication that they have. And it's a great job. And at that point, it's just a matter of how fast can they get here. And again, it's, it's, a, it's ongoing. It's a living breathing um, attitude that never ends and that people are constantly communicating. They're constantly, constantly training on all the new things that come out. They're just constantly running those drills uh, to make it safe. The next one, establish and utilize behavioral, uh, behavioral threat assessment teams to identify students who may pose a threat to either themselves or to others and provide appropriate interventions. That's what we learned today. Uh, again, all the students basically nationwide, the young man at Santa Fe and the young man at Parkland High School that did all that, all, all, all of those shootings down there, uh, those kids, didn't, they never broke the law. In their process of going through their, their districts, they never broke the law. That's why they were never on anybody's radar. But what they did have is they had some malfunction somewhere. They had some anger built up just because of their lack of parental support at home and because of a loss of you know, what they say, that one thing that triggers these folks is that, that they lose that, the, the loss of a girlfriend or a, or a, or a grandparent or, or, in one case, a dog. You know, a young man lost his dog, and that was, a, that was a straw that made him snap. So there's those things that, you know, again, so these threat assessment teams are created with different individuals, law enforcement, counselors, special education, uh, help me what other what else did they have they had administration nurse. teacher nurses and when uh, there's been a threat identified through possibly anonymous tip uh, if this threat uh, is a threat that will hurt harm someone or harm themselves then these threat assessment teams look into it and then then they 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 basically today were trained on on being able to ask the right questions and find the right people and, and find out is it really a legitimate threat and, the, and then if it is, uh, they, they, uh, they go through it and bring these young people in and, and help them to help manage it. And again, that's how you would catch someone who, who had that possible potential, potential to do something horrific and that's never broken the law, yet they've, they've acted not normal. And again, so I think this is what, what districts are. Uh, this is going to be something that legislation has now has mandated it. So as far as the state of Texas, we're going to all be doing it. And again, I think Conroe ISD is a little bit ahead of the curve or may, really a, a long way ahead of the curve as far as, as how you handle a threat. The next one, ensure safety and security committees meet, meet regularly and that they have an active and ongoing role in maintaining and safety and security. They've been around for a long time. Uh, you just need to make sure in a lot of places they're on paper, but they have to have to meet at least three times a year. Uh, and they cover not only they, they cover all safety just to make sure that 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 your kids, your teachers and your and and your parents are safe when they're coming and going from school. Uh, should adopt a standard response protocol and standard unification method as per protective measures that can be incorporated into the multi-hazard plan. This will be in the multi-hazard plan. And again, it's all about having something on paper and then being able to train and make sure that we know when that thing, when that event happens, that we know exactly what to do, where to go, who to call. And, and when the event's over, how do we get everybody reunified and get them back together? I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a thing that law enforcement We'll, we'll work on, constantly work on with administration to keep it uh, as, as, as updated as you can in there at the end. It's, it's, just helped it, it's to help train your, your employees on what to do. And at the very bottom, you know, if you abs, abs, have an active shooter in, your, in your, one of your schools, you know, they're taught to avoid the shooter. If they can't and they confront the, sh 
shooter. It's trying to at least trying to hide. And in the end, if you, if you can't get away, then then it's to do everything you can to defend yourself. You know, don't don't fight fight for your life. So again, this is this is something that every district should do uh, to be successful. Dr. Hines, going back to the district uh, safety and security committee. It said the Texas law says three times a year. How often is our district meeting? So <clears throat> there's a couple of slides that we'll talk about this a little bit more in detail, but to answer that question, up until now we have a school, we kind of have a school safety committee or school district yeah, safety did, committee. Yes. And they meet three to four times a year. I'm gonna look at you know, four times a year. We've been meeting four times a year. Under this under the new law, it, it, it defines another committee really or a committee that's more specific so it'll be a different type of committee the same one and we'll talk more about it and I think that committee is kind of going to really become more of an advisory committee to that committee where we we will tend to do the volume of things okay. and and bring forward those few items for the for the single safety committee and we'll work through it it's like anything new it, it you know I think at first we're all kind of figuring out the rules and we're waiting on some of the policies to come out and so at what point will outputs be kind of communicated with the board well it that would be through that committee and and that's something that we'll have to set up is how that gets regularly reported uh, there's some items that we will do there's several items that we'll continue to do at that level for example we might pick the school safety summer training courses right that might not be something that at this level you want to entertain right. Um, however, if we're going to bring through a major policy change or a major expenditure, um, there are certain things that that committee is required to do. And one of them is the threat assessment teams and authorize those. And we'll talk a little bit about that here. And, just going into that. and there'll be board representation on that committee as well. That's one of the requirements. In That's good. There's, yes, there'll be the board president and one other board member. Good. So, um, I mean, a couple of things I'll mention and, and hit this slide. Uh, one, I want to—I can't say enough about the importance of communication. And, and, and a great example of where the board has supported this just uh, a couple of years ago, we purchased uh, new radios for all of our buses. And how important that is, because one of the channels they can get to now can call our police department. Um, our police department, a few years before that, we bought radios. It's probably been longer than a few, but five or six years ago, we bought radios. Uh, and they have the channel and the ability during an emergency to, to communicate with other agencies. So um, communication becomes an ongoing important uh, area. Um, and I'll talk more about that uh, new safety committee uh, in a little bit. We do have threat assessment teams. Um, and as was mentioned, there's training, ongoing training. Ethan has been trained um, and he's setting up training for our campus teams. Um, we have developed a, a threat assessment document that will be completed by these teams and it will be included in our uh, view it system so there'll be ability to enter it into our uh, view it system and it'll be a record and we have it so we can re reference it later on this is just an example of how uh, it would look when you complete it um, so that's something that uh, we're rolling out uh, now uh, we, we should have some new policies regarding that coming to you soon uh, the standard response protocol that was alluded to, um, in fact, the safety committee that we referenced the advisory committee now that we're calling it, uh, recently recommended to change the new response protocol, which added that purple circle, which is hold, which is a new response. And that really has to do with there's an emergency in the hallway. Let's say we're dealing with a medical emergency. You want to hold everybody in class. That becomes the new one you teach, hold. Uh, up and up until then we've had and what's in your binder is the the first four which has been the standard response so lockout uh, which is used very commonly as you probably if you have children in school you get those messages something happened down the street we locked out which is basically is locking the doors and staying inside lockdown which is much much more intrusive has to do with shutting down your classroom and turning your lights out uh, hiding evacuating getting out of the building and then sheltering uh, which is something that we would reserve for like bad weather, severe weather, um, or a chemical spill, something of that nature. This is an example of uh, the documentation inside of our ERIP system that they, uh, the campuses go in and document when they're doing drills and if they've done their plans and so on. So we're, there's a way uh, Ethan Barton audits that and goes through there periodically to see how we're doing. I wanted to take a minute to add a slide about what I think is another important aspect to all of when we talk about school safety 
um, is we also want to talk about how we work with our students. And something that we embarked on probably about six or seven years ago is our journey into positive behavior interventions and supports, which is really trying to create a framework um, how we deal with students in, our, in schools in terms of building relationships and reducing um, disciplinary behaviors and, and also better understanding where we are. And, I, and again, I won't read all of this, but we have 57 campuses currently that are participating in our foundations, which is a school-wide um, and positive behavior intervention supports are used to help campuses to systematically create and implement processes that are proactive, positive, uh, and promote a climate of safety. And the campus leadership teams work through this uh, in a school-wide process. They usually have a team. They form a foundations team, and the team will meet as a staff, and they identify goals, and they kind of work through, we want to get better at this, we want to get better at that. And we were at a school today, and they were talking about, well, we've really been working on transitions. Like, we really want to do a better job of changing classes here. So they put a lot, and it shows. And it shows in how the, the students do it. So not all of our campuses are in this. Not all are currently. We're, we run almost, but we're not, not all there. So we've been bringing them on every year, and so we're getting close. Um, and then the other part of that is CHAMPS, which is probably more specific to a teacher classroom management. And we, we do this with all of our new staff. And we offer it also at back to school training, and staff development. So um, many of our teachers have been through this training. So different than um, going school wide, this is more about how a teacher approaches their classroom. And it's a way of thinking about behavior management. This is not a scripted program with step by step instructions, uh, but rather it's really about understanding approaches in, in terms of how do we empower teachers to make research and database decisions on classroom management, it gives them tools. Um, to implement expectations for students to create classroom rules, structures, strategies to deal with misbehavior. Uh, and we do average about three to 350 uh, teachers get trained annually in this. So now I just want to talk a little bit about new legislation. And again, I, I have to apologize to you that uh, our, our legislators finished their session uh, about the midway through uh, May. and. And now Texas Education Agency and Austin and Texas Association of School Boards and all of us are now trying to make sense of what some of these laws are. So we go and we do legislative updates to our boards in uh, Region 6 and we have lots of questions posed to us and we, we can't give them the answer because we don't know yet. Although we're required to do the training, we don't have the answer. But I can assure you as time as every day goes by, we will have better information and there are going to be some of these bills that we won't have. We may not know the information until the next session's already started. That's just how law works. Uh, it can be frustrating, but what I tell districts is that we just have to be, we just have to be patient uh, so that we get it right. Uh, the first one here, Senate Bill 2135, and basically this bill expands uh, the information as a school district was received from law enforcement when a student is arrested. So I, I know firsthand as a superintendent that, you know, we would have a kid in our district and I would find out that this student was arrested two weeks ago for something that had we known, he probably wouldn't be there right now. He'd be in an alternative school somewhere. So anyway, I think our legislators recognize that and now working hard to so that law enforcement gets your superintendent and those decision, decision makers uh, good information fast so that they can assess is this student a threat uh, to our other students uh, in our school. And currently, um, just a, a kind of a reminder, uh, we have the third largest police department in Montgomery County. We have 80 full-time and one part-time police officer, three canine units. Uh, 95 crossing guards that serve 120 locations, and we have 23 prevention control officers currently. Um, and our police department does a great job of coordinating and working well with all of the area law enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. so, so the next bill is House Bill 18, and I, as I said earlier, it has this session dealt a lot with mental health. And so with this, this bill, it added extensive training on mental health to, uh, and related issues to teacher preparation programs. So now these young men and women who go through universities and do their student teaching and all that, one of the requirements now, this is going to set on the university, on the, on the college level, is having these, these young folks more prepared and have a better understanding of, of mental health and to try to recognize some of the issues that some of these folks have, whereas in, in the past they had nothing. 
nothing was ever mentioned about mental health. So it's just trying to give them just something so that if they think something is not quite right, then they can, they can at least pass it on to the next level. And then it also, this bill expands uh, some of the school health advisory committee, which is called SHAC. Each of you, your campuses have a SHAC committee. Uh, it expanded their role uh, where they have to issue statements that, and, and talk about some of the policies and procedures uh, promoting physical health and mental health, which is, that's what's new for SHAC is that there's, again, a lot of talk about the mental health side of it. Well, we talk, you mentioned, if you'll go back just a moment, you mentioned here at the bottom and mental health resources available at each campus. So in, in the bill, what, what they've, what, uh, is, help me where you're, where you're at on this. I'm sorry. At the very last paragraph. The SHAC committee must post a statement of whether right before the, that you, the sentence above talks about promoting physical health, mental health of students and the physical health and mental health resources available. Yeah, so campus. But so what's my understanding what's, there are not mental health resources available at campuses. Well, what's what's about to happen in 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 through legislation is that they've designated 13 universities to provide uh, mental health resources to to the state. They're, they're going to go through TEA and TA TEA Texas Education Agency is going to roll it out to us. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing is, is that in this legislation, uh, they mandated that every service center in the state, there's 20 service centers, mm -hmm. are going to hire a mental health specialist. Now, Region 6 is not going to hire this specialist. It's going to be somebody that's from our area, and we're going to house them at Region 6 in Huntsville. And then they are going to be a resource for every district in our region. So they're trying to push those resources out. I think, uh, I think it's going to come slow. But I think it's going to come. And again, um, I, I see it probably having the, the, the quickest effect on our smaller districts just because they have nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, you're going to see from the university level and then from the mental health side, uh, uh, we're going to we're going to have we're going to get we're going to see resources once I think they're channeled through Texas Education Agency. <clears throat> or as you're right, right now we have nothing. Right. Well, and I know in the state of Texas, licensed professional counselors are retiring and going away, and we're not able to refill the the bucket the way it's been. Yeah, I mean, we have a, we have a shortage. Absolutely, we do. So, yeah. okay. Talk a little bit about the mental health uh, aspects in House Bill 18, and again, there's uh, remains to be seen how uh, this does play out. But right now, we'll answer about what we're doing. We are in the process of having all of our administrators, counselors, and nurses trained in mental health first aid, uh, which is a, a course uh, that our staff attends. Uh, we do train hundreds of our staff each year in nonviolent crisis intervention and de-escalation strategies, which, which we use CPI, um, which again is to de-escalate. Um, every once in a while, we do have students where we have to restrain because they're runners or uh, they may engage in violence, uh, especially with small children. We have to restrain them, and, and those people have to be trained at that point if we restrain a child. We currently have four campuses that have partnered with Tri-County for behavioral support, Milam, Grangerland, uh, Moorhead, and Armstrong. Our, our coordinator of guidance counseling, who is with us this evening, uh, regularly presents parent education ses sessions on suicide awareness and prevention. Our SHAC committee does meet. Uh, four times annually. They actually have a meeting tomorrow. I noticed they were setting up today. Um, we do have 148 counselors in our district. We have 65 nurses in our district. I know that's one of those things that was mentioned on the previous slide. And as and, and as you mentioned, it's uh, there's a lot of layers to this. I mean, there's both the education part of making people aware and educating families, and then there's the response part. Which is the hard part? The resources. Uh, is what yeah, seems to be the hardest. Yeah, what happens mm -hmm. once yeah. you have somebody who needs help? That is the hard part. This is just an, a you know kind of a quick overview. We have uh, a mental health uh, specialist on our staff. Uh, she's actually uh, someone from our grant that we funded out of that uh, hurricane grant, and uh, we've got several trainings lined up in the next uh, few months. You can see some of these are about. Um, uh, vaping and awareness about vaping, which is on the on the rise. Um, there's uh, several on e-cigarettes and vaping, uh, marijuana vaping. Um, a lot of these are parent and student trainings. Um, we also um, 
have other upcoming training um, on other topics such as positive self-image, um, what we put out on social media, overcoming adversity, positive body image, and developing family code of ethics. So uh, there's a lot of training going on for parents and students in this area, um, all of which we want to get better at and, and do more in this area. Um, there are other, other requirements that we're still working through uh, regarding how we deliver to students. Uh, probably the biggest challenge, and there's some requirements about delivering, for example, education about suicide awareness and prevention for students. And so it might look different depending on we have different schedules. Some have an advisory period. Some don't have an advisory period. Some do it through an assembly type or a push-in through classes. Uh, but we do have to do that kind of training with our students. Um, this is just an example of some of the presentations that are lined up on um, anxiety. You can see is a topic that we do a lot of training on. Um, Trauma-informed teaching we do for our teachers. And you'll see some references in the law that there's a big, um, in the last legislative session, there's a lot of attention drawn to um, trauma-informed teaching or dealing with students that have been through traumatic events, uh, both for our staff, for teachers. And I know, um, I know I'm talking to Barbara that they have some training lined up for all the nurses in this area. So um, these are just some of the examples of the trainings that we do in that area. House Bill 496 uh, requires districts to develop a, a, tra a traumatic injury response protocol no later than January, this January of 2020. And this protocol uh, must provide bleeding uh, control stations with specified uh, supplies. And uh, the protocol requires that TEA uh, uh, have a, that your peace officers have a TEA approved uh, training and that any person about any personnel who had reasonably used these blood kits would be trained. And they've also included it uh, to students, uh, seventh grade and higher. So again, I, what I don't know about this new law is I don't know if there's a requirement that you have a certain amount of blood kits per students that I don't know yet. I know that at the service center, what I've been pushing is, is that you would have a blood station or a blood kit for every defibrillator AED that you have. And so I've just told districts to just wait and see. And then whatever you do when you start purchasing these blood kits is that, you know, you go through the Texas School Safety Center. Maybe they have a vetted list of vendors that provide safety and they would be a good resource. We'll talk a little bit about one of the one of the. Uh, charges I believe for the safety committee the district safety committee is to approve our protocol for that uh, so that will, I think will be one of those first items on the agenda um, what we're currently doing and just will just share this is a picture of one of our AEDs um, and you can see it has a stop the bleed kit so we do have a stop the bleed kit in each one of our uh, stations um, we also have training that we do uh, through safe schools on a variety of medical emergencies including first aid and, and responding to those things. Um, kind of give you a quick overview. We currently have 209 AEDs. We have two at each elementary and intermediate school. We have three to five on a junior high school, depending on the size. We have six to nine at each high school, which includes one that travels. Uh, we have other facilities such as transportation, maintenance, jet, administration building, uh, that also, as well as 10 patrol cars have AEDs. Uh, each AED cabinet has one stop the bleed kit. CISD police officers have a stop the bleed kit. Each school nurse and athletic trainer has a stop the bleed kit. We also just put in an order for 366 more stop the bleed kits. Um, those will be uh, dispersed among the campuses. Uh, we provide uh, three American Red Cross CPR certification classes per year for uh, we identify a certain number of employees based on their function that we require to be trained. So if they're a coach or if they work in a, a shop where sharp tools or something can get cut off, tech theater, um, you know, anybody that's outside or travels a lot, such as ag teachers or the band teachers, uh, we would have them go through that training. Um, Stop the Bleed training is now being provided as part of that. So we just added that training uh, to those folks since they're already being trained in first aid and CPR. Uh, in addition, the Montgomery County Hospital District has also provided multiple Stop the Bleeding trainings to our staff. Um, we're expecting to get more guidance. There hasn't been, you know, in the law it says you got to use uh, 
you know, approved trainers. We haven't seen that list yet, but we're going out and getting trained ourselves. All of our nurses are stop the bleed instructors. Um, and just to give you an example, we had 120 employees during the September 12, 2009 CPR class get trained. I know I tended to stop the bleed training in the summer with the uh, hospital district. All school nurses, uh, I mentioned that, uh, school nurses provide stop the bleed training uh, to their medical emergency response team. So we ask each, each of our campuses to have a team that's trained in how to use the AED, how to perform CPR, how to stop the bleeding, those kinds of things. So uh, they are trained. We also uh, train our new substitute nurses, get extra training so that they're uh, familiar with this. Um, we also have the traumatic injury response protocol draft ready for review. All of our school nurses receive training this school, this school year in self-harm and su suicidal ideation during district-wide staff development. And currently, as I mentioned earlier, Health Services is collaborating with Texas Children's Hospital of the Woodlands to provide trauma-informed care training for all of our school nurses. So far, we've had about a third of our nurses trained so far, so we've got some more to go. I would just point just a reminder, we've successfully deployed the AD three times in life-saving efforts in Conroe ISD since we started that program. So um, it's certainly been worthwhile, to say the very least. As a, as a side issue, would you say how many, most teachers train with EpiPens? I don't think that most teachers are. We do do an EpiPen training for all staff on the video, uh, and then we do a more detailed training, I believe, if we have someone who has like a known severe allergy. But all of our staff, everybody will have taken the, you know, the basics of EpiPen training, you know, what to do with it and how to apply it. Uh, but we do more specific depending on if there are specific students that have issues with severe allergies or um, if they're diabetic, there could be extra training. Uh, how to apply certain medication. We have bus drivers that get trained on certain students if they have uh, certain medical issues. Barbara, do you want to add anything to that? Well, that's about the same. Um, if the student is, is pretty castrated and the nurse trains those teachers for that child, if they're leaving campus for a field trip, then that training takes place before they leave campus. And we have training equipment I'm, as a, the son of the peanut allergy, I applaud CISD in the last, well, he's a senior in college now, but the, going all the way through, CISD was always very proactive. And that's very appreciated by parents that have to live with that issue. Absolutely. Uh, House Bill 2195 uh, requires every district to include procedures for responding to active shooter emergency in its multi-hazard emergency operation plan, which I, I said earlier. And the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement must offer an active shooter training course and current uh, employed peace officers and school resources must, must complete the training no later than August 31st of 2020. So again, our legislators uh, as a result of Santa Fe, wanted to make sure that all of our districts were, were trained, especially in the active shooter uh, emergency protocol. And we mentioned already that the alert training for our PD that they do with the other agencies, um, as well as what we do with safe schools training, um, the craze training, which is additional training by our police department for staff, um, and then we also have the Montgomery County Special Response Protocol, which is a coordinated plan. Uh, again, these are examples of our um, active shooter EOPs, and they'll, again, be customized by each campus depending on their situation. So then probably the biggest bill that came out of, uh, out of legislation uh, this session regarding safety was Senate Bill 11. And again, this is one of those that addressed a lot of the governor's 40-point plan uh what they did is they had the bill uh, provides a safety allotment of nine dollars and 72 cents per student so i think uh, i've heard this from several legislators i don't have the exact number but the original number started it started at 250 dollars per student and it just went down and it went down and it went down so again, I'm not here to pick on legislators, but with for $9.72, it's, 
anything that we do regarding safety and we ask for money, they can say, well, we, we give you money. We gave you money. But here's the deal. We got some money. And I think the beauty of this is that in the next session, hopefully they'll just continue to add to it and add to it to support us. Again, a district like Conroe ISD, that would may not be so necessary, but those smaller rural schools, I mean, they would need every penny that they that they need. I, I, I said this earlier that this Senate Bill 11, it adopted standards for new construction and renovation mm -hmm. of existing uh, instructional facilities to provide a secure and safe environment. I think that's a wonderful point. Uh, it's uh, in addition to existing reasons for issuing bonds in the form of bond proceeds, the school may issue bonds for retrofitting school buses with emergency and safety and security equipment. And I would think IE cameras, seat belts, you know, those things that would, uh, that would go along with, with, with safety on a bus. Uh, also, the commissioner uh, adopted rules to offer a waiver of up to 420 minutes for those districts who train all of their educators. If they train all of their educators in, 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 a, in approved courses uh, that have been approved by the school safety center, they can waive 420 minutes of their school year. Also continuing on, continuing with Senate Bill 11, health curriculum is expanded to, in, to include physical and mental health. As we've said many times, the school advisory committee, SHAC, is in charge with recommending strategies and policies to increase parental awareness regarding early warning signs of suicide. There was a lot of talk about suicide. And there was a lot of talk about today about suicide, that the difference between suicide and homicide and homicide is the, is where they point the gun, which way they point the gun. And that a lot of these, these young men or w women who, who do these school shootings have, have suicidal tendencies. And, and what I learned today in, in uh, Columbine, when those two young men entered that school, one of those young men went to school to kill a bunch of people who didn't care if he died. And the other man, young man, went that day to Columbine to go to Columbine to die and didn't care if he killed anybody. So they had both instances, but in reverse. So again, a lot of talk about suicide. Uh, another law that came from Senate Bill 11 is that all commissioned peace officers have up to 180 days to complete trainings, training on the matter of matters related to working with student population, including child development, de-escalation skills, and uh, restorative practices. That wouldn't pertain so much to your district because you have a school police department who work with kids every day and they, they you know, they're not officers that are on the street patrolling. They're with kids. They're proactive. They know. But again, we're a big state and to try to uh, cover it all, uh, they, they require that training. Uh, also, Senate Bill 11 greatly expanded the requirements for the operation of emergency plan, which we've said over and over, and it just talks about training for employees and including substitutes and just to address things as communication in an emergency and uh, mandatory uh, drills, T talks about the chain of command, backup plans, and uh, safety for students in portable classrooms, and just a lot of things that, that, uh, that have to do with safety in, in, any, in any fashion. Uh, continuing again with Senate bill adds the number of positions to the local school and safety security committee and the committee must at least must meet at least three times, which we've already heard. Uh, Y'all's committee meets uh, four times. Uh, it also states that a district, if a district receives a bond threat or a terroristic threat involving a facility that has students, then notice must go home to those parents of those students as soon as possible. You know, you would think that's common sense, but obviously these laws are made because some, some, somewhere, somehow it didn't happen. But again, it's just requiring if there's a threat, then parents need to be notified. Uh, the Board of Trustees must establish a threat assessment and safe and supportive school team to serve each campus, which we've talked about today. Uh, every campus has to have a threat assessment team. A threat assessment team can have more than one campus as long as every campus has one. And then uh, the Texas School Safety Center is going to be in charge of vetting uh, the qualifications of every school safety provider. Listen, school safety is a billion dollar industry, especially now with all of these legislative requirements coming down. There's going to be people that are coming down to the state of Texas to make a lot of money. And whether it's good or bad, uh, the school safety center is going to vet, vet, vet people for uh, – the products that they offer. And that's why I said earlier, it would be great to go through them anytime you're doing 
purchasing anything with with uh, safety that makes sure that you're going to get uh, what it is you're looking for. And then finally here, uh, each district must adopt a policy on trauma-informed care and increasing staff and parental awareness of trauma, trauma-informed care. So again, it's just a lot of training, a lot of mental health, a, a lot of uh, just sort of the things that we've had to deal with probably in the last year and a half and and our, our legislators uh, put it all here in Senate Bill 11. And I, as I tell districts, listen, we have to just be patient. As every day goes by, we get a little more information until we can get it exactly like they, they wanted it when they passed law. We've talked about several areas. Uh, I, I'm going to go back and touch on a few that have been mentioned. One is the, the trauma-informed care shared earlier, a list of where we're doing training for several staff, counselors, and nurses, and that. Uh, the threat assessment teams, again, that's a new... We've been doing threat assessment for a long time. And our police, when they get a report through anonymous alerts or through a phone call, they're doing those in the middle of the night sometimes. So um, it's not a new process, but this formalizes it. And now there's a place to have a form and keep a record and, uh, and kind of standardizing it. And, and really, it's intended to get multiple people looking at a situation, whether it's a student or a staff member or whoever the, the case may be. Um, but it, it, it does involve, and for a school, it's going to be an administrator, it's going to be a counselor, uh, it's going to be the police officer, at least. And then it may be other people, someone who from special education might be involved, or the nurse might be involved, or uh, so that the committee can grow or, or shrink depending on the situation. Um, we are um, just getting this going uh, and formalizing under the new system. I envision just from the the few brief experiences we've had this fall, but uh, I do envision that we probably will have both campus and a district team because there's a need sometimes to have backup or another set of eyes looking at it. Um, the uh, the notice about you know putting out the notice to parents if if there's a threat made at a school uh, certainly um, we're aware of that and. We try to get those out as timely as possible. Obviously, you don't want to send out something too early where you don't have facts yet or you haven't, you're still investigating or you don't want to uh, put out misinformation, but, but certainly we're, we're getting that information out as quickly as possible. Um, the, uh, I alluded to earlier, all of our administrators go through the incident command training, the incident command structure, so that they're familiar with that. Um, and the, in, terms, in terms of the SHAC committee, I'll give them uh, kudos. A few years ago, they had enough foresight to recommend to the board to keep health in our curriculum because that was an option to, to drop it. And, uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of requirements for student education that land in health. So um, it was, it was a, a very good move. Um, a couple other things I'll point out that are in that bill. Substitutes re, uh, re, must receive training, and we do that through safe schools, as well as the emergency operation procedure information through the substitute handbook. Uh, we also have additional training for substitute nurses, and we recommend to our campuses when they have someone new on their campus to orient them to their safety procedures. Uh, all of our uh, police are trained on school-based law enforcement training, and, um, you know, I'm so proud of our police department has for years been ahead of the curve, in, in, in my opinion, in terms of how they work with schools and work in the school setting. Um, and it's something that I think we should be proud of and celebrate that, uh, you know, back before they outlawed, you know, writing Class C uh, citations, we, we wrote not very many. Uh, and we've always been kind of just a little bit ahead of the curve and uh, proud of that group. As was alluded to earlier and in the Senate Bill 11, we have to have a district safety uh, meeting for that new committee that's named in Senate Bill 11. Again, we've had a school district safety committee for, for years, but... Uh, it's formalized that now the board president and one other board member, the superintendent, uh, a teacher must be on there. Two parents must be on this committee. Um, so there's some sp specific named representation and there's some task. And um, I hope uh, at the next board meeting to have an information item at the next uh, scheduled board meeting. We currently do have the school safety. We're going to change that name to the advisory committee since they'll deal with kind of some broader issues. Um, and we have just a kind of as a, an awareness item for you. We have two crisis counselors. We have one mental health specialist. We added, uh, 
we were fortunate enough to add one and a half social workers, five and a half counselors, five, five behavior support teachers. And we were able to convert four part-time clinic aides into full-time positions with that Hurricane Restart grant, which will end at the end of this year. Uh, our facility designs include exterior door sensors now. So we have uh, exterior door sensors at uh, Suchma. Uh, alarms, cameras, sprinklers. If you're, you're well aware that the, there's a new voice evacuation alarm that we put in the buildings when we do major work. Um, door hardware, we showed you some pictures of that. Digital radios, uh, controlled access. We're upgrading our Raptor visitor uh, system. That's the one where you check in when you come in. Um, there are other features. We still are doing work. Um, you know, there are $44,472,000 worth of safety-related improvements in the upcoming bond referendum, including um, repeaters for first responders, which we call BDAs, at some of our big buildings where uh, they do penetration tests with radios. And if it's, you know, if the radios aren't going to work inside of that building, we put in a repeater. So if police and fire inside of our building, their radios will work. Um, and it's a very expensive piece of equipment. We also have uh, some vestibule work to do at the high schools. Um, we are going back and looking at exterior door sensors. Uh, we're expanding our uh, keyless access points. Uh, we have been working on some of our elementaries, you know, as a common design where we have the side doors and the office can't see the side doors. And so we've been playing with different solutions uh, for those side door, side door access to reduce the likelihood of runners that get out the building without us seeing them. Um, we also have uh, door hardware enclosures we've shared, uh, video camera additions and monitoring, exterior lighting, sidewalk upgrades, some fence upgrades, um, protective glazing on some of the glass. We always are looking at playground standards. Um, as was mentioned up front, we look at all areas of safety and that includes where we have accidents and can we reduce accidents um, we uh, also include uh, communications intercoms digital radios repeaters uh, panic buttons we've been experimenting at two campuses with uh, some phone based or application based uh, panic buttons and so we're kind of trying those out to see how we like them as a solution that's a very more affordable solution for us going forward uh, so we're going to see how that goes, as well as some backup power um, in terms of some replacement of some of our uh, generators um, for communications and life safety. I'd like to just yes. highlight, too, as Dr. Hines mentioned, there's $44 million that's line itemed for safety in the bond. However, much more of the bond package is directed at safety. For example, uh, all new campuses you know, when a new campus is built, you, you're moving students that are in a current building that is over capacity with portables, you're moving them into a new building. Uh, when you look at the additions that are included, specifically at the Woodlands High School, College Park High School, York Junior High, those are campuses that have um, multiple over 12 portables currently. Um, those additions are to bring uh, those students under the roof. And you saw from the, gover the governor's 40 point plan to reduce exterior doors and harden the exteriors of the buildings so that's included. And then, and that's 315 million of the entire package. So almost half um, is included for new schools and additions. And then when you move to campus renovations, the single largest line item in the, the bond package is under campus renovations at $146 million is Conroe High School, which is Presently, as we know, six buildings with over 100 exterior doors. And once again, um, Conroe High School Master Plan 2 would bring that building under one roof, limit the number of exterior doors, once again, following the governor's um, recommended plan. And that's important and not to take away from that at all. But I would like to comment that uh, in my... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. In my visiting uh, Conroe High School, specifically in, in CTE, <laughs> it's kind of difficult to get in these days. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have got it locked down. For whatever it's worth, mm -hmm. they're tending the business, Good. okay? And I'm telling you, if you don't go in the front door of the rotunda, mm -hmm. you're not getting in that building. And, and, unless a kid or somebody lets you in, just mm -hmm. luckily enough. Mm -hmm. It's pretty impressive. Yep. I mean, and that's a very old building, and that doesn't help when they go from the tween building. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is just... 
for somebody from the outside to come up and pull on a door. It's locked. Well, like Doctor Zimmer mentioned, it's attitude. Attitude. There, it's they're doing the, they're doing the best they can with what they have. Absolutely. Just a compliment. Yes. Thank you. Pass along. Thank you. I know we've covered a lot of stuff, and I'm sure you have some questions. So we wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to ask questions. Dr. Zimlick, I had a question about, I didn't see it in the presentation. I know that the governor and the legislature expanded the school marshal program. They did. The limit on school marshal before the legislative session was one to 200. Yes. Now they took away the, the limitation. So now you could have as many marshals uh, as you. Right. So they basically, I think, in a way, they it was basically probably an experiment to see how that it would go and how many school districts would be involved in it. And, and I think they've, they've seen the success, and so then they took the requirement away. So my question, and I know that because we have an ISD police force, I'm not sure it's necessary, the Conroe ISD, but are there other school districts in our region that have armed administrators and or teachers that you're, I don't need to know names, I just, just wanted to know, are there or are there not? They are, they're, they are, and they're more than you think. Okay. Any other questions? Well, one of the other things that we'll talk about in the future as we continue to consider our organizational chart and staffing, as you can see, the legislature has ramped up the requirements on us, not only in um, performance, but also in reporting. And um, you know, we continue to, to um, look at our staffing and to see that you know, what, what do we have and who is available to meet these requirements. And it may be that we uh, would bring a recommendation to you in the future to look at our organizational chart, potentially add a position to, to help guide this um, effort throughout the district. That's a consideration that we may have. You can see it's just the volume of what's expected now is, is really uh, been ramped up on us. I like the idea that we have the positive behavior interventions uh, at 57 campuses. I'd like to see whatever we can to get it all of our Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that that's important. Point. In my opinion, I believe that one of the, the biggest things that children don't have is uh, an ability to fail or an understanding that if they fail, they can still pick themselves up and they don't have any resiliency. And because they don't have any resiliency, they see no hope. And I think that leads to a lot of detrimental behavior. And so I think that is a great way for us to instill in children, and I'm saying children being from pre-K all the way up to being a senior in high school, the ability to understand that they can fail, but overcome that failure, that they can still be successful, uh, and that one failure doesn't end their, their thought of what their future's gonna be like. And so I think that that's a great program. I think that's the wave of the future for us, is to, to be able to create that atmosphere where we allow kids to not be as, we want our children to all be successful. I think I understand that, but I want people to understand too, they've got to have some resiliency. And the only way you get resiliency is by not doing well and overcoming mm -hmm. it, coming back and being stronger the second, the third, the fourth time. I mean, I've always said we learn from our mistakes, not from our, our, uh, our, our, our failure. We learn from our failures and not from our successes. And so, I think it's a great way to help our children understand that they can overcome and they can get better. And this positive intervent behavior intervention, I think, would be a good way to help with that. And if I could add to and what you're saying is, I think I learned that today with our threat assessment teams. It's in no way punitive. It's not meant right. to be punitive. It's about what it's meant to be is that I care. Right. And so that you would name your you would name your threat assessment team. It has a name, whatever you want it, but it probably wouldn't be threat assessment. Like I'm just use an example, it would be I, the eye care team. And then what it is, it's about trying to identify those kids that have had a threat and that, that you care about them, you're trying to help them. And again, man, if you if we could approach it that way, because the, these kids that do these these god awful things when it comes to school shootings, they want help. They, they, they if, at some point they would love for someone to help them. And so, again, it's about we care for you, we love you and we want to help you. So, Dr. Hines, uh, if we have 57, 58 campuses that have these and, and six that don't, uh, is it a matter of money? Is it a matter of new schools coming online don't haven't had time yet? It's time more than anything. Nice. You know, we've been we do a certain number every year, bringing on a cohort. Um, 
one of the challenges is we probably had a couple of schools that came on and have gone off and we need to bring them back. Uh, and that happens sometimes when we have a change of leadership over time and we might mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. lose our right. focus or our priority and have to come back. I, I agree with Mr. Sanders, uh, 100% no, no excuse. Let's get it. Sure. Any other questions? How many officers do we have? 80. 80. 80. And I, I mean, I know it's been a point of debate about the growth that our district is going to have, but it's my understanding what 2,000 in the last. No, oh, I think we're year. over 2,200 uh, that we've added since September 1st of last year. In just the point. one year. Mm -hmm. One year. And so, given that extreme growth, um, I mean, how, how are we going to be approaching that from a numbers perspective? Are we? I, you know, we we certainly talk about this from a, the administrator side. I think we want to continue to grow our police department. I know there's a you know, the financial reality, but I think it's important that we just didn't we approve a two year plan to increase by a large we we like we, thirty two or so right thirty two we we did the one year plan and we did this year two two more officers this year and yes and we did eight prevention control this year but I think we got most keep, of the time it's it's the ability to hire that many right rather than Will yes. we hire hiring officers right now all law enforcement across the state as well as nation having a hard time mm -hmm. recruiting uh, especially good qualified officers what's it pay is it better than insurance i mean uh, <laughs> yeah. our screening process is pretty tough uh, well, yeah <laughs> so, to answer that i do think we i think it's helping you because he give you a nice Adding uniform to that staff. <laughs> i could be a i could hold this up though. yeah Yes. I had a question kind of piggybacking on Mr. Kidd and Mr. Sanders' comment. Uh, Dr. Zimbalka, you had said that uh, some of the, we'd be surprised, I can't remember exact words, but we'd be surprised at how many. And I was thinking if we have 80 officers currently with 64 schools, that's I think 1.25 officers, if, if we were to just divide it out. And then with Mr. Kidd saying about the growth, is there something that uh, maybe at another time we discuss more people if we can't get officers from what I'm just hearing? We might have to investigate some kind of Marshall plan or whatever that looks like. Because if other districts have, you know, five people at a, a district and we have 1.25, we're actually behind the curve on protecting our students. Uh, that's a great point. I think the premise for having a guardian in your district is the location and the amount of time that it would take for the county to get there. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's more about response time I see. I think I see. than it is about district. Yeah, I see. I and so I, I don't, I don't mean to, but for them, it's about response. And, uh, you know, you have a county and you have four officers that are in that county and something happens at the school district and they're on the opposite end of the county. Sure. Now we're talking about 15 or 20 minutes. That is the sole purpose of a guardian that at least they can maybe fend somebody off until until the law enforcement comes there. Whereas here, you don't have that issue. Yeah, Mr. Okay. I, I, I could speak to that having been involved in that world and been one of those responders with one of those agencies. The math may work out to 1.25. Let's just say, for instance, something happened at Pete High School and there's an officer there on campus, but within seconds, minutes of that call going out, you're going to have Conroe PD on location. You're going to have the sheriff's office on location. You're going to have precinct one on location. You're going to have troopers. You're going to have troopers on location. You're going to have game wardens on location. Um, and we are blessed to have that communication that was mentioned several times in here. And it's not a matter of, hey, dispatch, can you see if you can find the number and call Conroe PD and get us some help? I mean, it's just a matter of the call going out on the radio and eight agencies hearing it immediately and responding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Besides that, we have, you know, roving patrols mm -hmm. between the you know, neighborhood. Yes. When I say that Reeves and Geesinger and Cryer, right. pretty we have, tight ship, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, right. I mean, I, I would say you might could get from Cryer to Geesinger faster than you could walk or run across Conroe High School's campus. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you could be on the wrong side of the campus and be longer than it would take them to respond. So that's that's, that's you know, how we've deployed our officers is looking at uh, groups of schools, looking at the, the outlying schools and start looking at officers assigned to just one school, uh, that one school, well, that's elementary what, and then because it's outlining, it would take long. 
like Stewart, like Broadway, like uh, like San Jacinto, those schools are a distance away, then we would have a stationary officer. Uh, then we'd have patrol like we have Cryer, Reeves, and Beesinger. And then we still have patrol that covers a general patrol in the area. Then, of course, all the high schools and junior high uh, officers. But, Chief, uh, we've been on field trips before. And, uh, you know, as we jump from school to school as a group of board members, okay, we see the same officer checking the outside doors at school. So yes. they're, they're not just there looking for stranger danger or whatever y'all whatever y'all professionally do. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're making themselves useful and seeing and, and, and all those other things that are so important for the safety of the campus and just checking those side doors that administrators can't see if a teacher left them open so she could get back in from PE. You know, I don't think they do that anymore, but you know, it used to happen all the time, right? So anyway, I think that's important and I'm just kudos to your guys. And that's kind of the audits that we do every day when we do routine patrol. Uh, officers are supposed to get out of the vehicle, check the inside, make sure everyone's okay, walk around the building. So that that, that happens uh, on every shift. Why well, would just close out? I just really want to thank any man or woman that puts a vest on to go to work every morning to protect our kids. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much for being here once again. Thank you, Dr. Simica, for being here and uh, helping us present this information. We appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you.